we guys. Our service begins at page 184, and I encourage if there are those for whom it's a difficulty to, to remain standing for so long, at any point, you please just be comfortable to, to be seated. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, Merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, our sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I will speak of your testimonies before kings, O Lord, and shall not be put to shame. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. to God on high.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies and grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. You may be seated. The first lesson appointed for Reformation Sunday is from the 14th chapter of Revelation. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers. Consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. The epistle lesson is from the third chapter of St. Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter.
So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will, you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we sing the first five verses of hymn 555.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text is from Romans 3 that we previously read. We pray, Lord of your church, as you once allowed the light of your divine truth to glow brightly in the work of the Reformation, so continue to reform your church by your word of life, that fleeing from our works to the refuge of Christ and his work alone, we might be numbered among your family of grace, abiding in the pure teaching of your word and receiving of your sacraments until your believing children are revealed on that great day. Amen. Reformation Day is, it is not the day that we dethrone Christ from, from his throne and, and there set Dr. Martin Luther and worship him. We are going to make some reference to the historical circumstances of the Reformation this morning to kind of tell a little about what was behind Luther's work. But it was all about returning to the only sure foundation of God's word. But above everything else, this, this festival celebrates the gospel of Christ, not Luther the man or any man, but the God-man, our Lord and Savior. Above all else, this day we pray that in God's church that the saving gospel above everything else be exalted. That uh, it never become a kind of old dusty appendage to human rules and laws. Now for Dr. Luther, the central questions of the Reformation weren't just the academic questions of a university professor to his faculty colleagues there at Wittenberg, nor were they simply a priest speaking to his order. Luther was a pastor also at St. Mary's Church and preached every, every day at St. Mary Church in Wittenberg. His chief concern was how to know for himself and for the sake of his people a God of love and grace. For him, it was a personal and pastoral issue. He knew how unworthy of Christ he was in all of his thoughts and, and words and actions. The popular preaching of Luther's day emphasized God's law, our duty toward God, and emphasized God's holy hatred toward every infraction of the law, his wrath against sin. In this way, they sought quite literally to scare people out of hell and into heaven and into leading moral lives. However, while the law of God shows us the best shape of a life blessed, only the gospel of God's free grace and forgiveness in Christ, only the gospel can supply the power and the motivation to live our lives for God. And what was seldom heard in those days were sermons extolling the grace of God and reassuring the Christian that what Jesus did and not what the poor sinner must do was the most important thing. Now, it must be said that this, this sad condition owed in part to the extreme scarcity of God's word in the day before all of the priests could have just got it on their phone or, or had a copy laying around wherever they wanted. They weren't blessed as we are today, even though the, the printing press had been invented, was so, still so early. They weren't blessed as we are to each have the access in our own homes at any time we want to read and study God's word. So we understand the, the struggle for pure teaching. God's law is important and necessary. Our text says it makes us conscious of sin. It stops our mouths. It holds us accountable to God, Romans 3 says. But if the law is the only word, the rules and threatenings of an angry God, there will come only one of two tragic outcomes can be the result. Some are going to be Pharisees 
who in the hearing of the law do this, do this, do this, begin to think, well, I guess I can do it. And by George, I think I am doing it. I'm making it on my own. Like checking off boxes of a spiritual to-do list. We call that works righteousness because it seeks, it seeks our righteousness not in Jesus but in, in us. The second tragedy that can come from only the proclamation of the law is that others are going to live in, in fear and hopelessness. Some will be driven to despair knowing that they can never measure up and have no hope. For Luther, it was just that personal struggle against uh, that monster of uncertainty that you could never know. In those days, of course, death seemed always nipping at, at the heels. In, in the century before Luther's birth, 1483, in the century before his birth, it's estimated that as much of, as 45% of the population of Europe was wiped out by the Black Plague in the mid-1300s. And such pandemics were recurred continually. Infant mortality was very, was very high. Life expectancy was very low. The leisures that kind of distract us, that, uh, that give us little joys, they were unavailable to a people who made their living eking out uh, from sunrise to sunset, scratching out their living. And so many, like Luther, longed for certainty and hope that when that death came calling, they could be sure. But the teaching office of the church offered little comfort, only more rules. To soothe his fears, to find, find somehow that comfort and confidence, Luther became a monk and then a priest, thinking that a shortcut to God's grace, but the uncertainty was still there. The daily duties of the monastery only reminded him how short he fell of God's demands. And the church's teaching didn't make it better, only worse. It was taught that for believers, for believers, a purging fire or a purgatory awaited after death to quench the guilt not satisfied in this life. Luther wasn't directed to Christ and to Christ alone, but was taught to pray to the Virgin Mary and to find in her someone who would be a mediator, mediatrix, to carry his petitions to the Father in heaven. It was taught that indulgence papers could be purchased, lessening the dreaded tortures of purgatory for one's self and for one's dead loved ones. But because these things have no foundation in Holy Scripture, they could never bring certainty and comfort, only more fear. Believers, of course, were even taught against the sin of presumption, meaning that one should never be sure of their divine destiny. The Council of Trent, only a few years after Luther's life, condemned to hell the teaching that one should be sure of their standing before God and their heavenly hope. Their idea was, if you remain sure, you'll work harder to be sure that they would regard as the height of arrogance. But if you're always on your toes, your head on a swivel there, you'll stay at it. But the mightiest weapons Dr. Luther and the Reformation employed against Rome were not their errors, but their truths. The old truths of sacred scripture, which pointed to a sure and living hope, and it was here, by plunging into the pure fountain of God's holy word, that the Reformation recovered the promises of the gospel, those treasures of God's grace in Christ Jesus, too often buried beneath superstition and churchly tradition. God's word doesn't teach us to be uncertain or to guard against certainty of salvation, 
rather Hebrews 11 teaches, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. St. Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. God doesn't want you to be unsure, but to live with God's certainty. And God's word teaches you exactly why you can be, because your Savior is stronger than your sins. When the law of God leaves you and me unable to utter a word in our own defense, when God's law leaves us inescapably convicted and guilty before God's bar of justice, boy, in that moment we are left without any hope or help in ourselves. And that's actually a good thing. If your hope rests within you, even a little bit in you, in what you do, what you accomplish, well, then you're never going to be sure. For you can always know, I mean, we know Jesus got his part right. He did his part. But you'd never know if you have done enough because you haven't and you can't. That monster, that uncertainty is only slain by the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I am not ashamed Romans 1 teaches. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. The gospel of Jesus slays that monster. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, our text says, and you notice, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So Christ Jesus did enough and so much more than enough that when he got done the doing of it, he said, it's finished, it's completed. Now in the passage before us, Luther was awakened by the Holy Spirit to see that God has given us the sure and shining hope that puts to death that uncertainty and the fear. We hold, our text says, that one is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. See, the works of the law are those things that God requires of you. But only one man ever kept God's law perfectly, the God-man, our Lord and Savior, who did it as your substitute. The eternal Son of God assumed human flesh in Mary's womb to be exactly that, to take your place before God under the law. At just the right time, Galatians 4 says, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his woman, his son, born under the woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So where God has spoken in Christ, that has to be the end of it. There can be no uncertainty. Jesus came. He came to do what you and I fail to do. And so we're never going to boast in our goodness. There's none of that. But rather boast that God kept his old promise that he made to Adam and Eve when he promised one would come and, and crush the devil's head. God doesn't lie. Since God doesn't lie, God's word poured over your head in the waters of baptism can give you certainty. All of us who've been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Believe it and don't doubt God. Romans 5 says, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is never a sin of presumption to take God at his word. And for a child of God to, to remain unsure when God tells you, I sent my son to die for you to remain unsure. That's not some kind of pious humility on your part. It's doubt and it's unbelief. When God says to his baptized sons and daughters, here, this is my body given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. You might think it's too good to be true, and it is, but it's true because God says so. 
Christ Jesus was raised to life for your justification. And one little word from God can banish all of the doubts of the devil. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If God loves the world, then God loves you. You're certainly included in those promises. It's that mighty gospel in that good news we find comfort. Yes, the law is necessary. It makes us conscious of sin. It shows us we need a savior. After the gospel gives us Jesus, it also shows us what the wise shape of life looks like, but it can't save you. It's the gospel that points like John the Baptist standing in the river to Jesus coming down the hillside. There he is. Behold the Lamb of God. Jesus takes away the sins of the world. The tragedy of our day, perhaps, is that few people believe or know that they are sinners. They call it a personal choice or a lifestyle. And in that way, become our own little gods, thinking we're just fine on our own. But if that's you, if that's you, you do well to remember that you don't measure up and can't to God's holy demands. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if God's law awakens that uh, uncertainty in your own ability, so much the better. Then you can fall to your knees before a Savior of grace. And when, you're, when you learn the truth that you're a poor lost sinner, remember that it's for, for people like you, for sinners that Christ stepped from heaven to live and die, And for sinners such as we, he rose from the dead to declare that sin's terrible wage, it's been paid. Jesus did it for you, for me. He did it for the world and and offers it freely to you through faith, through a faith that rests in his completed work. And that's not arrogant. Simply to believe what God tells you is so. It's not boasting. Our epistle reminds us, we maintain that a man is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. God's done it all from beginning to end. Faith's simple answer is, amen. Thank you, dear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for this precious gift that we could neither earn nor deserve, but your Son won for us. Amen. We rise. And now may the peace of God, which passes human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God. may be seated as the offerings are received.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We remember in our, in our prayers for this day, Louis Linenberger's family as his, his son-in-law, Kevin, has passed away this past Monday and it will have a, a, he, they will have a, re, um, a reception, a gathering there at Heard Hendricks Funeral Home in, in Knoxville next Sunday afternoon from 2 to 5 um, for remember Louie and Gail and in, in, in our prayers this day. We also remember it was requested that uh, there has been a, a suicide in the community of London Mills and, and a community whose hearts are hurting at this time. We remember those family members affected and loved ones affected in our prayers as well. And uh, we remember John and Kathy as they celebrate their anniversary for God's good gifts and blessings of, of marriage. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have renewed your church in every age with the voices of those who recall your people to the gospel, who speak your word in all circumstances. Receive our thanks for Martin Luther and those with him who contended for the gospel against a great many enemies. Make us bold that we would also contend for the faith against those who would silence our voices or distract your people from the one true gospel of the crucified and risen Christ. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, guard and defend us and your holy Christian church throughout the world that we may be protected from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, make us truly your disciples. Keep us in your word, free us from all errors, and make our homes and families peaceful. Preserve all fathers and encourage them for their godly task, that children would be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, all moms and dads as they proclaim the word of life and teach their little ones. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, we... Pray for faithful rulers. We commend to you our president, governor, our mayor, and every elected leader, for those who make, administer, and judge our laws. We pray that you would help us to be faithful citizens and that we, that we might be diligent about the duty that you give us as, as children in, in this, yes, even in this civil kingdom to vote, to serve you, to be a voice in this world for all that is good. We pray that you would help us to do that, uh, that work for the sake of our fellow man and for our neighbor, and that through it you would continue to provide those leaders that would be a blessing to your people. We pray for our military men and women in dangerous places throughout the world, our police officers, our EMTs, our, our doctors and nurses and medics and those who provide care. We pray for our farms and fields, that you would keep safely our farmers as through their hands we receive the blessings of the harvest and each day's bread. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father, for Terry and Jana Lee and Dan and Anita and Joan, for Joyce and Fern, for Mitch and Frederick and Eva Jean, Stephanie and Beth and Janet, for Louie and Mina. We pray, dear Father, that you would keep them, that you strengthen them, that you would be with their loved ones as, as they bear the cross and that you would bring them deliverance, peace, and health in your good and perfect time and according to your good and perfect will. Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, for the whole community of London Mills and all who grieve, that you would bind up their wounded hearts. For Gail at the loss of husband Kevin and, and for Louie and, and Mike and all of, all of Kevin's family, for Wyatt, that you would give them comfort and peace to rest in Jesus' own victory for us and for our salvation. Lord, in your mercy... 
God of grace, you gave Eve to Adam and in the garden instituted the instituted marriage to be a sign of your goodness and your love for your people. We pray that you bless all husbands and wives who live together in this holy estate and strengthen them. We rejoice with John and Kathy in this good gift and pray that you bless all of their days to come, that all of our homes continue to be outposts of light in a world of darkness. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us by your word from the darkness of error and into the light of your grace. Help us to walk in that light, guard us from error, from false doctrine. Grant that we would not be ungrateful and despise your word, but receive it all with all our heart. Conduct our lives according to it and put our trust in your grace through the merits of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. We rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord. Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Now, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. 
body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. The true Take body of Christ, Christ given for your blood. sins. body and blood of your Lord and Savior, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift. 
And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be seated as we sing the last five verses of hymn 555. seated just a few announcements this day i apologize i was trying to remember verses six through ten or five through ten and and uh, forgot to give you the whole benediction or just was occupied in in a different thought there and that that's my mind sorry about that um today we have you know, the, the big activity for this day is that 2 o'clock we're going to start our 
our afternoon celebrating the Reformation. And, and Rose, do you have any, any thoughts about that? <laughs> any directions? Then I would just say, Leah, do you? We had four leftover houses yesterday from the hardest houses that we forget. So if you would like one of four, your first one can be 10 bucks. You get one. Make sure you take your icing home. Thank you. The LWML, we have been told that, that we were going to go to the Kensington this week. We're going to meet here. Right, Joanne? We're going to just meet here. I can't see. Yes, okay, so they, they've been having some issues with a COVID outbreak there, so, so we'll continue to keep Judy in our prayers and plan on joining her, joining her there at Kensington in a few weeks, perhaps. Um, no other real announcements. You are, you know, I know we are going to get sick of this election season, probably like I am. Encourage you, if you would like to check out the voter guides there in that uh, were provided from the Illinois Family Institute. That is part of our, our duty too, as the people of God, is to, to be active in our civil government and, and to prayerful about that certainly and, and voting in all the ways that we can to support those in authority over us. So if that helps you, you're encouraged to take those too. So, all right. We'll see you this afternoon. <laughs>